Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am your 27th favorite dad in the community, Jacob West, Papa West. And I have some interesting uh, news for everyone. Uh, we all saw the announcement uh, that Malcolm had to unfortunately step down uh, from late TV fights. Uh, so I decided, what the heck? Why not step up, actually do something officially in this league instead of being the... Uh, the guy who always just uh, does stuff non-canon. Let's make it canon. Let's uh, let's do something. Uh, so I am proud to announce that I am going to be a co-commissioner of Late TV Fights. And yes, you heard that correctly, co-commissioner. I am not doing this alone because this would be horrible if I was doing this alone. No, I am also um, proud to introduce, unfortunately, he's not able to be with us today, but Alec Miller uh, is also joining me uh, as commissioner for LATV Fights. So breaking news, this is why you watch the, the show, so you can find out all this stuff. But yes, no, we are excited uh, to, to run LATV Fights um, with this new season of TMG and all this fun stuff. And we have to have a championship match here for Debate Kingdom here in the next couple of months. So... I am presenting to you Late TV Fights Road to the Title. And no, that name is not trademarked because that has been used 20 times at least. But for the road to the final, I have two gentlemen eager to step back in the ring of Late TV Fights. First person that I have directly underneath me and off to the side just a little bit. Joe Fairley, Mr. Hot Fuzz. Joe, how are you doing? I'm very good tonight. Jacob, how are you? Doing good. Are you ready to, to take down Ryan? I don't know whether I'll take him down, but I'll certainly give him a fight. All right, definitely. And little spoiler alert, uh, because we already said his name, our other competitor, the man who is crazy enough to do this while driving, Ryan Carmel Mountain Pain. Ryan, how are you doing today? Pretty good, J uh, Jacob. Uh, look, yeah, it's going to be crazy, everyone watching. Why the hell am I doing this while I'm driving? Am I this desperate to fight Kate <coughs> Burns? And the answer is, you're goddamn right I am. Jay and I went head-to-head -head in our cha championship match. And as much as I looked through it, he had me on the ropes. I want to get back again. It was a fun match against him. And I'm looking for a fun match against Joe as well. I mean, what better way to start off the new year than just talking about TV? Definitely. And I love the enthusiasm, the the willingness to compete. The uh, I want to take someone down so bad that I'm willing to risk my life and not drive or drive while being impaired by uh, having focus somewhere else. Uh, Joe, I don't know if you have uh, contacts in the uh, San Diego area, but please do not let them know what Ryan is doing. Uh, we would hate to give give you that advantage. All right, so we have this great match coming up. And thankfully, I am not alone in the judging. I have two judges eager to watch this fight fight out. I can't think of better words. I'm sorry. My first judge is a guy directly to that side of me uh, because directions are hard sometimes. We have Jonathan Peck, the Raptor Master. Jonathan, how are you doing today? I'm doing very good, Jacob. Very good, though. Uh, I'm a big fan of these two gentlemen in the bottom of me right here, though. And we dealt with some training matches for ourselves, though, right here. They're very cool, great guys right here. It's going to be interesting for me judging what they do right here. So can't wait what it's all about. All right. And then on the far left... We have a gentleman who every time I'm on a call with, I know I'm going to have a crap ton of fun. We have Nikki, the Arsenal Sullivan. Hey, man, Nikki, how are you doing? I'm doing I'm good. Doing great. It, he's doing this while driving. I mean, this is either going to be a legendary performance or a legendary disaster. I can't wait. It, it, it's inspiring what you're doing. Um, good luck to you, sir. Good luck to both of you. Um, my God. All Right, me, guys. I'm just under. I'm driving under sixty, so there's no, there's gonna be no disaster unless I forget. Unless the only disaster that's gonna happen is if I start prattling off while talking, in which 
from everyone knows from my past matches, my biggest problem is I have too much to say. Godspeed. All Godspeed. right. So again, regular, before we start, I do want to make a quick disclaimer. Uh, TMG does not um, does not approve. Uh, what's that word I'm trying to think of? Does not condone uh, impaired driving, whether it's drugs, whether it's being on your phone, whether it's uh, being in a debate. Don't do it. It can wait. No. Unless your name is Ryan Payne. Uh, he's the only one allowed to do this. Everyone else, no. Don't do it. Just remember, okay. not worth nine it. times out of ten, it can wait. Yeah. So, with, without... I challenge the behavior. Well, um, I'm sorry uh, your challenge is not upheld and you lose your challenge for the rest of the match. So, anyways, without further ado, let's get this show on the road. Quick thing I want to talk about Quite is weird. the rules. Um, we have four predetermined questions. Uh, each question is going to have three rounds. The first round is a 90-second opener where the uh, opponent talks about their answer, tells us what it is, tells us why that's their answer. Then we move on to a five-minute free-form debate where the two of you just yell at each other. Um, please, no talking over each other. Let everyone talk because we are all friends here. Um, I do have one rule. It's called the timeout rule. If you are talking over each other and I cannot hear you uh, and it's loud and obnoxious, I will call timeout. We will take 10 seconds off the clock. Once both of y'all are finally done talking, we'll take 10 seconds off and then we'll get right back into it. And I am a father to toddlers. Do not test me. It's funny I say that I've never had to use it yet, so... And then we will move on to the 60-second uh, closing. This is where you sell us on your argument. Tell us why your answer is correct. Tell us why uh, your opponent's answer is incorrect. Uh, after that, we go on to the judges. Uh, we award you our votes. Uh, most votes gets a point. And first to three points wins the match. And another rule that we are changing. Uh, this is something that Malcolm wanted to do. Um, and since he uh, stepped down, he wasn't able to enforce it. But I'm a nice guy. I want to try it out. Let's do it. Of the four predetermined questions, two are going to come from a movie or a, a TV show, not a movie, wrong league, of a TV show of your choice, kind of like a strength. Uh, instead of me just giving you four random questions, two are coming from uh, TV shows that you pick as a strength. So it is time to move on to question number one. And question number one is, what is the worst episode of Castle outside of season eight? So, Joe, we are going to start with you. You have 90 seconds on the clock. Time starts when you start talking. The episode I chose for the worst episode of Castle is season six, episode 23, for better or worse. Now, I'm not really going to crap on um, Andrew Marlowe's creation here because procedurals are hard to do especially in this world where there's so many out there. But this episode is poor. It's like the entire creative team behind the show stepped away until they properly stepped away before season eight came in. It's just a rehash of everything we've seen before with this type of episode. It's cliched. It's poorly written. The character decisions don't make sense. And to top it off, it's a season finale. Season finales are supposed to hit hard, resolve plot issues, and do it in a way that's big and epic and it does none of these things are you conceding the rest of your time no i'm saved i'll save my time okay all right so we have joe starting it out ryan we are moving on to you you have 90 mm -hmm. seconds to open up your argument time starts when you start talking Okay, when it comes with Castle, whether people agree or disagree with season eight, it's up to it's up, it's up to debate. Really, it's sub, it's subjective. For me, when it comes to the worst episode of Castle, it goes into season four, episode two, Heroes and Villains. This came off of Rise, which played off of the cliffhanger from season three of Kate getting shot. This episode, after. Heroes and Villains, unfortunately, just falls back into the formulaic episode of Castle, except the difference is they start to try to give us a difference between liter literary writing 
and comic book writing with them hunting down a vigilante going after criminals. Now, if this had been put in the middle of season four, it would have been fine. But the fact is, this was worse because not only were they trying to give us a mirror image of the vigilante who, spoilers, turned out to be a cop, and the uh, writer, comic book writer, basing, still, basing all of his comic book writing off of this vigilante. It's literally Castle and King Beckett, but you put them in the comic book world. It's bad because it's just lazy writing at its best. Also, it, it once again tries to get up the whole will they, won't they situation when it was pretty obvious after season episode one of Rise was that Kate went through a traumatic moment that she just really wasn't ready to open herself up just yet. And episode two is kind of like, Oh, but don't worry, guys. The, the whole romance is still ding, you know, he, dwindling out there. And I'm going to concede my time. You had two seconds left. So uh, good wow. use of your time. <laughs> uh, I know. I, I, was do, I was fingering the, uh, the last 10, and I'm like, you're not going to be able to see. But... I'm not really looking at anything, guys. <laughs> I'm just looking straight ahead. Yes, which you are yeah. supposed to do. I'm like, I just have to keep it, keep it the same. Uh, keep it repetitive or else I like, screw up. I should treat this like a film class. Don't look at the camera. <laughs> exactly. Again, if you are driving, that is what you should focus on, is the yeah. road, kids. All right, yeah. so now we are moving on to our five-minute right. freeform debate. We have Joe with For Better or For Worse, Ryan with Heroes and Villains. We have five minutes to fight it out. Time starts when someone starts talking. Here's the thing, Ryan. What you've got to bear in mind is that this episode, for better or worse, is just a rehash of an old Bones plot. Bones did it better. That's the worst thing. It's called um, Stargazer in a Puddle. But the thing is, this episode is so cliché. It's a season finale with a wedding. Guess what? Everything that could possibly go wrong goes wrong. We've never seen that before. It's just well, that's the point of this whole thing. Ever since, ep sorry, Joe, but ever since episode one and season six, it's been building up to their marriage. I mean, whether if they were going to tease it for next season or if it was going to be at the season finale, of course they're going to do something like that, pull out the tropes. I was expecting that going in. And also throughout season six, they're doing this whole tease that Kate has done things in her past that Castle knew nothing about. So the fact it turns out that she has a secret husband didn't shock me at all. I mean, it was a surprise, yes, but it was just something that, okay, how are we going to stall this until the last moment? But with heroes and villains, as I mentioned, after Rise, Kate had gone through a traumatic moment, nearly dying. So then to immediately jump into this episode to where it's supposed to be like we're back in the whole will they, won't they formula after just going through a dramatic moment like that is just, a, it's just terrible. I mean, it's, it throws you off of a loop. But it's, this is the season six finale. You've gone for six seasons. A season finale, as I said before, it should be something exciting. It should be something different. It should give us uh -huh. shocks and surprises, not the same cliches that have been done better by other shows before it. Well, the thing with season four, episode two, this season four, you're right in the middle of its run. It went for eight seasons. Season four, episode one was a really great start to the season. All right, it said, you know, it came out 2012. We've got superheroes. We've just had the Avengers movie. Superheroes are the in thing. But the difference is with between your episode and mine is that your episode is peak castle. The dialogue is snappy. You believe the character decisions. And the difference between yours. I would kind of argue. Bridge, sorry, Joe. I would kind of argue season five is peak castle, but that's just me. But yours is what well, yours is still. You like you said it compare, doesn't compare to the. Season four, episode one, Rise. IMDb ratings, 8.7 for Rise, 8.6 for Heroes and Villains. All right, it might not be an episode that you particularly like, but we're talking about the worst episode. And the worst episode has got to be one that can, just on a consensus basis, people didn't mm -hmm. like and people did not like for better or worse. You look up the worst episodes, apart from episodes in season eight, for better or worse, it's in there. Because the season finale, it's the ending, it's something we all we were all waiting for and expecting and looking forward to, and it was a disappointment. And you can't But do this that is TV. Finale. Castle had already been renewed for another season, man. I mean, going into this, everyone wanted the whole thing where Castle and Kate ended up getting married, because I mentioned before, that's what they were building up to, especially with having Castle, I mean, with Kate losing her opportunity in season six of becoming, uh, working in DC, now she's back to being a cop. Castle, because it's science, moving from being a literary writer to being a PI, both of them are at a point in their lives where they realize that 
they were at a good point too when they got married, what kind of adventures we go through. And the whole thing, we had to have see how Castle builds under pressure by ha- by watch- by you know juggling everything that normally uh, would fall under the bride's friends, like having Esposito or with Lainey or with uh, his, or even with Molly's character Alexis. But with heroes and villains, it was just look going into heroes and villains. The moment they real that the moment they discovered on that fi- on that freeze photo of the vigilante who that Deadpool s ripoff character. It was pretty clear it was going to be ridiculous moving forward, and maybe it could have been a good uh, could ice cool moment, uh, ice cooler moment after Rise. The problem is, is that the moment they unmasked this vigilante and said and showed it was a cop in Beckett's precinct, all immediately were thrown with, oh, what's the difference between Beckett being a detective and her being a slash cop, and Velasquez being a cop slash vigilante? These were not questions we need asked after Rise. Where One she minute. Died from a- these were not get, questions I, that need to be asked right now. Maybe, like I said, if this if this was placed later in the season, mid season, to where Beckett was at a place to where she can ask these questions, heroes and villains would be a good like in the middle of it, not after Rise. But the issue is, you're saying even you're saying if it was placed in a different part part of the season, it would be a good episode. The point of the map, my point, fact of the matter is that my episode is a season finale. It should be epic, and it's not. We're both arguing about the placements of these episodes. But the point here, is, even, okay, men- yeah. even mentioning a Deadpool ripoff. It's 2012. The only Deadpool that the mainstream audience had gotten was in the Wolverine. And thank God that's been shot out of existence. But, <laughs> but as I mentioned, it was talking about comic book writing versus literary writing. And I, I want to talk on the point. Uh, with the worst season finale when it comes with Castle, I would have gone with season two. Because after that in though, this, if this was just another will they, won't they situation. They wanted to stretch out into season three. If season six, it was clear we were going to get a conclusion, and then the twist Time. happens. Okay. Time. <laughs> All right. So now we are moving on to our minute closing. And Ryan, it looks like you're home. Yay, we can, can condone yeah. what you're doing now. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, people can stop judging me now. <laughs> All right. So we have 60 seconds to close it out. Joe, since we started out with you, Ryan, uh, you're going to open up the closing. 60 seconds on the clock. Time starts okay. when you start talking. For better or worse, while it does everything out of the book when it comes to TV writing, pulling all the wedding tropes, guess what? We knew that was coming in from the marketing, how they were building this episode to uh, with Beckett nearly going across every case when it comes to the disappearance of her mother, Castle, becoming a PI. These were just points. These were all roads leading to where they were going to meet in the middle, which was for better or worse. While it was um, the worst scenes of finale, that le- that begs the, the diff. That that's a different story. But the worst episode, I still give it to heroes and villains because. Heroes and villains, it just goes through the same moments. They find the case, they discover what the case is about. Castle does these little quips, these conspiracy theories, which unfortunately turns out to be right in this situation. But guess what? Ties back to their will they won't they relationship. We didn't need that story. The, I mean, the fact is, with heroes and villains, it was just, like I said, it was copy and paste. We get two characters that could have gotten some good personalities, but instead it's just another fantasy moment of putting Castle and Beckett's relationship together. I'm sorry, but after Time. Beckett getting shot in the heart, Time. I didn't need that. Time. Ugh. Okay. <clears throat> All right, Joe, we are moving on to you. You have one minute on the clock. Time starts when you start talking. I've already said procedurals are hard, and to go for to go for the six seasons the way it did was fantastic. But this is a season finale, and it just rips off the whole issue with it was the Castle and Beckett together. They always had good snappy dialogue, and they do in Heroes and Villains. But in this, it just feels like completely different writers were writing this episode. It's cliche. It reuses old tropes. It it's just appalling. Nothing feels right, and it all feels forced. Heroes and Villains was the start of season four, second episode. It's peak. The dialogue is witty. It's snappy. You believe everything that's happening. And given that it was 2012, it's a brand new take. It was a different take on the vigilanteism that we hadn't actually seen before. And something that Castle was really good at doing and had been good at doing. And then season six, my episode, episode 23, it just falls apart and falls into old tropes and just rehashes old things. and rehashes the complete plot of a Bones episode that was done better. Everything about that finale has been done better before. And in Heroes and Villains, it was something new and did it well. Time. I, I figured you were conceding, but 
Again, just a couple seconds left. So, again, great use of your time, gentlemen. This has been a great argument so far. And now we're moving on to the judging. So I'm going to go ahead and start off with Jonathan. Jonathan, who gets your vote in this argument and why? Um, both Joe and Ryan put interesting arguments of why their shows didn't have a cent work for Castle Run here. They put out good points, though. But the person for me, he have a better understanding why the seat, why the episode of the show was not that great. I'm gonna go with Ryan on this one because at least Ryan brings up of that. Yeah, it's a new trick thing of the show before though. But at the same time, I don't. I think he expressed it very well. Though he just didn't execute it correctly. It gets a sort of get into the repetitive nature of the show right here. And I hope that episode was might be a bit of a downfall right here. So I had to go with Ryan. All right, so Ryan gets the first vote. Nikki, we are moving on to you. Who gets your vote and why? Well, both of those episodes sound absolutely atrocious, so good job, guys. Um, Commendable job on you, Ryan, getting home safely. Um, I have to say, your episode probably sounded like something I'd more want to watch, the vigilante and stuff like that, but your argument was just so well. You just kept talking and talking and talking. You had so many great points. It, It... you, you just dominated in that round. And, and it's, I, I got to say, like like early in the rounds, early in both rounds, I was like, oh, ooh, he's, he's, he's shaky, shaky performance. But you just like, it was a pacing thing. You got there. So I, I got to give the argument to you, Ryan. All right. And so with that, Ryan gets the first point. Um, I, uh, just because I love my opinion, I was kind of going the other way. I was leaning more towards Joe. Um like one thing, one thing he brought up was uh, Ryan made the comment that if you had his episode anywhere else um, in the season, that it would have been a good episode. Uh, and then also with the whole, when you think of Castle, you think of Castle and the other chick I, whose name I can't think of at the top of my head. Uh, you Beckett. think of their Kate Beckett. yeah Beckett. Thank you. You think of their um, witty dialogue, <laughs> which you don't have in uh, season six, or you don't have in in his episode. Plus with it up being a finale, it really did not live up to uh, most finales like they should. Uh, so I was leading more towards Joe, but again, that is why we have three judges. So we don't go off of one person's belief. I do so actually that, have a humorous fact check on Joe. Ryan Reynolds, Deadpool was actually in X-Men origins Wolverine and not the Wolverine. Yeah. Irrelevant though. <laughs> Irrelevant. Sorry, but yeah. to be fair, Wolverine, the Wolverine's 2013, Origins is 2009, so I still have the years. Right? And it's the better movie, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think we can all agree X Men Origins uh, Wolverine is complete and utter garbage, so. Uh, yeah, but I yeah. still like watching yes. it. Oh, man, Nikki. Like we're going to like have a long garbage. talk about how I am a disappointed father. Um, for what you just said, but again, we are not talking about that right you, now. But I like watching we'll, that. We'll talk about that later. We'll so, judge, era, not right. judging, man. <laughs> so now we are moving on to question number two. Question number two: Which member of the "It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia" gang would you most want to hang out with? Joe, since we started off with you, Ryan, we are starting with you. You have a minute thirty seconds on the clock. Time starts when you start talking. I'm going to get this point out of the way. All the cast members of the of it's sounding Philadelphia, the main five, they're bad. They're terrible people. Let's be honest. They don't have great morals. So that's one thing I know me and Joe and Ken and Creon. But out of the five, the one I can see, I can actually see myself hanging out with is Mac. Now, Mac, he comes off as a bit of a meathead, uh, an overgrown at times bullying person. But compared to everyone else, you clearly see it on him. But with Mac... He's the kind of guy that you do want to see yourself kicking back, having a beer, maybe going on like a weird adventure when, when it comes to crazy ideas, like when he and Dennis wanted to uh, uh, hunt cricket or when he and Dennis thought they could, uh, you know, have a, you know, do like an underground speakeasy in the bar. I mean, the fact that both these guys own a bar, so you can imagine yourself always having like a good time getting drunk with them at least for a couple of days. And then the next night you realize, okay, we should party, we should party down here. And also Mac, he seems like someone who could play either as a good or a bad wingman. It just depends on how you use this guy. 
And right now, just compared to all of them, I just think Mac is better because he's more more vulnerable and the more human of all of them. And I'm just going to stop here. All right. So we have Ryan starting that out with Mac. Joe, 90 seconds on the clock. Time starts when you start talking. We can definitely agree that they're all bad people. So it's a very difficult choice to who you're going to hang out with. But there was only one choice for me, and that's Frank. Frank's the guy to hang out with. And it's for the simple reason that the man is a financer. You've already said they own a bar. They don't. They run a bar. Frank owns the bar. Okay, with every single one of you, any other choice you're going to have, you're going to have a bad time. Mac, you're going to have a bad time. But with Frank, you might have a bad time, but at least he's paying for it all. And in the end of the day, there's some parts of his personality and you will get some you will get some good laughs some good fun, some good memories. And a, very, and no, no, uh, a nice heavy wallet by the end of it. Now we are moving on to the five minute free form debate ryan joe five minutes time starts when someone starts talking look i'm not going to sit here and pretend that frank's a good person he's an asshole like the rest of them and he's a troll person but the difference is mac no matter what point no matter what point in the show you want to hang out with mac you're going to have a bad time do you want to do it at the start of the show when he's bigoted on a religious basis do you want to go in the middle of the show when he's just I don't know, but mostly out of shape, and you said he's going to be a good wingman. He doesn't. They even have a speed. I said he's going to be a good band leader. Or you're going to have him at the end of the show when he's all, all he cares about is working out and riding around on his ass blaster three thousand bike. As he's I mentioned, have a bad time, Joe. As I mentioned, Mac, look, Joe, you were, you may have a slight point when it comes to having a bad time with Mac, but at the end of the day, rather if it, like I said, I never said I want to hang out for him a good time. At, when I, depending on how I hang out with Mac, depending on my day or night ends, I'm going to have a story in the at the end of it. I mean, let's take a look at someone that who constantly hangs out with the gang but ends up coming back, and that's in the character of Cricket. No, he was her, His life was literally ruined by the gang, and yet every single time they approach him, he's always down to do something. I'm not saying I'm going to be like Cricket, but when it comes to just whatever adventure Mac is going to propose, as long as Dennis is not assigned with him, I know that I can manipulate Mac or at least sway him to events to where I know things can work out in my favor. With Frank, unfortunately, he is bullheaded throughout the entire thing. He will bulldoze through almost anything he's into. I mean, look at constant times he's with Charlie. I mean, the fact that he constantly hangs out with Charlie, he's always into Charlie's way of his living habits. I mean, for Christ's sakes, Charlie lives in an apartment where so many cats are in there, and the fact that he doesn't realize he has cat food, and the fact that he and Frank like to do the same damn thing every night to give you an idea where Frank's headspace is at. Here's the thing. Frank has always said he's a financier, and all he wants is a plan. As long as you give him a plan, he'll finance it. You said you want to be like Cricket. The only reason Cricket goes back to him in the first place is because they give the guy crack. I didn't say it. Okay. There's, no, there's no way that you want to be in that situation. Frank always wants to have a good time. You look at the stuff he does with Bill Ponderosa. You look at the stuff he does with Charlie. Even when he goes to find a new gang, just to, just because he's bored of hanging out with these guys. All he cares, he said, look, no, I'll pay for it. I'll pay for this. I'll pay for that. Yeah, but the gives him time. That's all I care about. And look, the, the other good thing for me, look, I'm getting married, okay? So I want someone who's going to keep as many women as possible away. And that's what Frank is going to do. He's going to do his little dance, go for it, go for it, and just keep all the women away. So that's absolutely perfect for me. And then at the end of the night, he can go off and bang some of his whores, as he likes to say. No, no. I, I'm oh, going to interject here. Frank, you would get to the... Do that. No, when it comes to a wedding... Frank would look to the one person who is designated at the singles table. It doesn't matter how many women you want him to run away. He is leaving. He's walking home with somebody. I mean, with Mac, he's the guy I would bring to a wedding to make sure no woman gets near. The fact that he tries to hit on everyone. And one thing I know for damn sure, he tries to hit on my wife. I knock his ass out. Everyone at this at this wedding knows that this guy is bad, bad fucking news. And it makes me look like a goddamn hero. As I said, Bring him back along. I can manipulate or sway things in my favor. Now, with Frank, as I him being a bull, you mentioned, yeah, him going off to a new gang. He comes, what happens? He blows through them, comes back to the original gang. When I mentioned that he had an underground den going on underneath the bar to where the whole thing ends with a Russian roulette situation. Is that the point where I want to have my idea of fun go all the way to the deep end? Frank may be a financier, but at the same time, 
you should realize sooner or later throughout the season, he should be drained out of money. And the fact that he still owns the bar is ridiculous, which is why I assume that Mac and Dennis ran the bar because, let's, let's be honest, they're the ones who are constantly there every day and every night. They want to keep it going. You say that, but look, it depends. On, again, I said it, it depends which Mac you get. You can get early Mac where he's going to, as long as, <laughs> if, the, as if the wedding's not a religious ceremony, he's going to kick off. One minute. Deny, he'll deny climate change. He'll deny something because according to him, science is a liar sometimes. Or is it going to be middle of the season? Is it going to be middle of the show, Mac, where he's just going to sit around and eating all your food, claiming that he's tacking on mass? Or is it going to be end of the season, Mac, where he's definitely not going to hit on your wife because he's come out of the closet by then, and yeah. he's just going to spend the whole time working out, hoping that Dennis notices that he's worked out and lost all the weight and ripped. Whereas Frank, all he's going to do is pay for the wedding to make sure that we have a good time because that's what. Frank and then he does. ends up sleeping with your. And he ends up sleeping with the slug and you throw salt on her. Okay, look. The worst Frank's lowest moments come when he either wants to get back at his dead wife through trying to hook up with his sister, trying to hook up with his sister-in-law, or he ends up sleeping with his sister-in-law's daughter. And also, I mean, yeah, his endless parade of porn. I'm sorry, he will bring that to your party, whether you want to or not. At least with Mac, the whores are going to leave because they're tired of him. With Frank, he will force them Time. to All right, and we are moving on to the closing before I forget, because I am a forgetful man, because that's what children does to you sometimes. Uh, one more rule. You do have a one-minute extension to use uh, either in your opening or your closing. Uh, you can't do it to that five minutes because uh, we don't want you to give your um, opponent an advantage. Uh, so you do have a one, one-time one use of a one-minute extension to use in your opening or closing. I do ask that you please let me know before um, you start answering the question, because if you're in the middle of – that round, you're like, hey, can I use my one minute? No. You have to say it before. So with that, uh, Ryan, since we started off with, with you, Joe, we are starting with you with the closing. You have 60 seconds on the clock. Time starts when you start talking. The problem with hanging out with Mac is that you never know what Mac you're going to get, whether it's going to be the exercise freak, the religious freak, or the eating freak, or – consistently he will be manipulated by Dennis and he will leave you as soon as Dennis comes up with a good idea. But Frank, as I've said, the man is a financer and all he wants is a good time and a good plan. You give Frank a good plan and he will finance it and he will have a good time. It's shown consistently throughout the show that the man knows how to have a good time. The man wants to have a good time and that he will do anything possible to have a good time. And that is why you choose Frank to hang out with. You don't want to choose Mac because it's good. You're going to, you're just going to have a bad time. He's going to, he's going to, spout his beliefs on people or he's going to annoy you or he's just going to talk about Dennis the whole time and personally I'd rather just go out and have a good time I don't have to worry about the money I'm spending because it's all been sorted out by somebody else than hanging out with someone who's just going to try and push their beliefs on me the entire time that's not my idea of a good time all right and time so now Ryan we are moving on to you Close out this argument. You have 60 seconds on the clock. Time starts when you start talking. The thing with a good time, everybody, we all have to understand it soon comes to an end. Unfortunately, with Frank, him being the financier, he is going to make sure this party keeps going until you are passed out, until you are dragged off your feet, nearly clinging to life dead. With Mac, on the other hand, all the three different versions you brought up, there's a limit to Mac sooner or later. Rather, it's the hungry Mac where he stays around, hanging with you until you're out of food, meaning the party's over, or there's going to be the workout Mac where he is going to be pumping you up or you're going to be pumped beside him because, let's be honest, you got to want to get that competitive testosterone built up to when you guys want to go out and hit on women. Guess what? You're going to need to have that physique. You're going to need to have that appearance. And then morning Mac to where you can manipulate him. So let's be honest. Mac has come up with good ideas. The religious... The fact that he argued against science was able to able to convince people that science, just like religion, is based off of people explaining something that may or may not be true. That kind of Mac, if he can convince the hottest chick in a bachelorette party to sleep with me, I want to have that guy with me. Time. Time. All right. So we are finished with question number two. Now moving on to the judging Nikki, we are going to start off with you. Please tell us who gets your vote and why. Okay, so this kind of started to feel like an argument of uh, which one of these guys 
was the worst of the two. Because honestly, I'd rather stay home and watch two of those episodes of Castle than hang out with either of these guys. But um, I, I feel like, Ryan, you, you brought up a lot of points for why the other guy was bad. And but, but like it seems like somebody's life would be at risk with that guy. Um, whereas there is a chance for a good time, but also risk of death. Um, so I, I'll, I'll give the point to Ryan. Sorry. All right. So we are moving on to me now. This was very back and forth uh, the entire five minutes. Um, and it really was one in the closing. Um, I'm going to give my vote to Ryan as well. Joe, you're hammering um, in on one thing, and that's when you hang out with Mac, you don't know which Mac you're going to get. I love that argument. He was just able to rebuttal it uh, in that closing. Um, and then also with the with the whole Frank is a financier, Ryan said, well, he can, he's not consistent. Um, you know, he can leave you for another gang um, and then come back. Plus the whole, once the party is done, he doesn't really care about you. Uh, so I, slightest of margins, I'm also going to go with Ryan. Uh, so now we're going to go to Jonathan. Jonathan, what are what were you thinking? Ryan does get the point, but what were you thinking? Just because we uh, we like opinions here. Um, I would have gone to pick Joe, actually, because at least he pulled up a very interesting right here, though. Yeah, it's half the time. He will might give you a lot of But at the same time, he will give you a very little, let's say, seniority, but I'm going to give you a little guides right here to help stuff get done. Now. So I want to get Joe the point, but can I say for the both of you, thank goodness you didn't put Charlie Kelly as one of your picks, so it might be harder to do. Seriously, but Joe had that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with well, that... Too, Ryan just gave me a point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ryan, I'm sorry, Are but we cannot... <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Please, we're keeping the fight uh, interesting. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Ryan has taken a two nothing lead. So Joe, it's do or die time as we move on to question number three. And question number three is what is the best HBO original TV show? Joe, we're going to start off with you. Uh, you have 90 seconds on the clock to open up your argument. Time starts when you start talking. My pick for the best HBO TV show is one of the greatest TV shows of all time. In fact, until Breaking Bad came along, it was probably considered the greatest TV show of all time, and that is The Wire. Uh, the reason I picked The Wire is just consistently every season was great performances story arcs everything about this series was just fantastic it's expertly written it takes it takes a world that we know a little bit about and just delves so deeply into it and just gave us so many memorable characters so many memorable moments and it was just one of the best written performed and produced tv series to ever be made let alone by hbo and for me there was, this was an easy choice for me that to pick the wire it's an incredible show it really does just it has the highest highs and it has even the lows are pretty damn high everything about this show it's still talked about you still you can look online at lists of what's the best tv show ever made what's the best hbo original show ever made and the wire tops almost every single list it's not just my opinion this is a consensus this is a critical consensus the Wire is an incredible piece of TV, and it's still relevant even after it's finished. And I will concede my time. You had five seconds left, so. All right, Joe starting off with The Wire. Ryan, 90 seconds on the clock. Time starts when you start talking. The HBO throughout its inception of original programming has put out some really good ones. I mean, on a majority scale, they've had a lot. And for looking at, even amongst some of the top best HBO programming, I'm going to go with Deadwood. Now, Deadwood had, just like with The Wire, had great critical writing. It gave you a list of memorable characters. Um, its season structure, made, it didn't last as long as The Wire did, but 
when it comes to Deadwood, the being introduced to this world set like in the West, the old West, you're given not just good guys and bad guys, but the main theme is morality. You have no idea what choice <coughs> old people are going to go down from. Rather, you're introduced to the lone stranger you think is going to be the good guy. Turns out he could be a fucking murderer or he could just be as corrupt as the officials in town. Or you have the corrupt official who's being the bad guy for the greater good. You just don't know when it comes to the up and end of the morality tale that Deadwood provides you. And when this show got canceled, there was a huge uproar of people wanting this show back. Even now, people are still clamoring for a revival of Deadwood or even Deadwood to be turned into a movie. Now, sure, it may not top a lot of lists like The Wire. When you have a consensus of people when it comes to top 10 or top five lists of Deadwood, Deadwood would definitely be within that list, just along with The Wire. And I'm going to stop here. Also stopping with five seconds left on the clock. All right. It's like a theme. Sorry, y'all don't get any bonus points for uh, synchronizing your times, but <laughs> good job, though. Yeah. All right. So it. now, Ryan with Deadwood, Joe with The Wire. We have five minutes to fight it out. Time starts when one of y'all starts talking. Ryan, you're absolutely right. Deadwood would be part of that list, and I'm not going to argue that fact at all, but it's not top of that list, and The Wire is top of that list. You said it yourself, people were clamming for a movie, and do you know why they were clamming for a movie? Because it didn't finish strong. It did not have the ending it deserved, whereas The Wire did. It had those five perfectly strong seasons, and the thing with Deadwood as well is that that was it. You were opened, swearing to look out on his balcony, see all of Deadwood, and that was the show. It was about the town, and it was great about the town. But the thing about the wire is that every season it introduced a new element. It started off as cops and robbers. It introduced then it introduced the unions in the next season, and then the schools, and then the politicians. Every season it grew, but it never lost the focus about what it was, and its focus was about its characters, and that was the key thing about the wire. It never lost its focus, despite how increasingly incredible the scope got. That may be true with the wire, but the thing with the wire, like you said, it took every season to build to its time. Deadwood suffered around. I now, I'm not factually correct, but this definitely suffered around a time where HBO was always shortchanging and cutting a lot of seasons. And the fact that Deadwood, right around season three, was fine, was not only clamoring critically, but it was getting to the point to where they were talking about out, like really stretching outside of the town. Ian McShane was always a pleasure to watch within that show. Now, let's be honest, The Wire, great character, yes. But the thing about The Wire was, the longer it went, the seasons after season six and season seven, has been argued to be not as great as season five because they started making some choices in the wire. They started creating some writing characters like with uh, Dominic. Uh, I'm not I'm not going to waste my time with actors, but the thing is they chose certain characters, Jimmy, the cop Jimmy, having him run his own police unit, almost being this wholesome, this morally strict cop, all of a sudden starting to waver a little bit. Nobody didn't like that. So by the time the later season came, they had to course correct. Unlike, unlike Deadwood, where morality was the constant theme throughout that season. So, so no one was either surprised someone had to do something, whether it was out of survival or without the protection of people they cared about or for their own self-interest. You knew what these people would do, whether they shocked you or not. The thing is, The Wire isn't just a show with style and attitude. It is a show with philosophy, with a worldview, and it's a show about humanity. Although it goes into the cops and robbers, Every single character was fleshed out, and that was the most important thing. You even look at the end of the story. You look at Bubbles when he actually fought, oh, the whole story was him. You know, he was a drug addict, and by the final act, he finally overcame it. And it was that even that small character had that beautiful moment. Everything about the show was well written, well thought out. It was planned. It knew where it was going. Deadwood may have knew where it was, knew, known where it was going, but it never quite got there because it was cancelled early. That's and that's exactly the problem. It can never be considered great the best because it never got a chance to tell its full story. It's what it was. Well, that's well, well, that's well, that's well, sounds well, like the fate of most TV stuff. shows. I mean, if that's going to be a knock on Deadwood, I would say it'd be, it would be the same of shows on HBO, like a uh, band of bros meant to be a mission, but almost kind of like a uh, carnival or like six feet under, even though six feet under ended, most people thought that it veered its way off after season four. And even when it came, even with shows like true blood, even though that season ended, that high went, it went downhill after season four as well. The Wire really came close after season five, into season six, touring that going downhill. They only mainly, by the slightest of margins, decided to course correct. 
the thing is with tv show you the reason you have you go with tv over a movie is because you want to flesh out these characters and that's exactly what the wire did it fleshed out every single one of its characters everyone had an appropriate arc everyone had a story everyone had ends that you didn't see coming some of the biggest shocks were that were seen on tv at the time were from the wire deadwood itself it had those high highs but it had the really low lows Whereas one minute wire, it had the high highs but it did not have those low lows it had some lows but they were no they were still they were still damn high and that's where the difference is it got to tell its story it was fully fleshed out the characters were fully fleshed out and that is why you go with tv over making a movie because you need you want to flesh out these characters and tell these characters story i do want to say i did say people want either revival it, it i did say people i did say people want not just a movie but either have it come back on hbo and yeah that could be a focus most of the consensus has been wanting the deadwood to be a movie but there have, I, be, there have been constant rumors of HBO choosing to bring back Deadwood. The problem is most of the stars have moved on to brighter things like Ian McShane, Timothy Oliphant. Uh, God, I don't want to. I'm gonna waste my time with actors listing them all. Uh, I, I mean, they have. They did do a Deadwood movie last year. Oh damn! You got me on that. <laughs> no, but so, but even then, they're just they do all these Deadwood movies like they did with Band of Brothers. Time. Like they, yeah. I sh- <laughs> all right so now we are moving on to the closing stage 60 seconds on the clock joe we started with you so ryan we're going to start with you in the closing second 60 seconds on the clock time starts when you start talking now deadwood was revived into a movie which my opponent did joe did get me on that but Still, at the same time, people still wanted to see more of Deadwood. HBO could have done what they do with miniseries. Like, they could have done eight, maybe 90-minute or 85-minute episode structure. And so that would have definitely finished uh, with Deadwood's story. Kind of like with The Leftovers. The Leftovers wasn't as long of a se- season as The Wire was, but it still had smart writing. It still had great characters fully fleshed out to where within three to four seasons, it was able to tell its story. They could have did this. Deadwood was the same thing. Bring it back. Have maybe a 10, <laughs> nine episode structure. Bring back Ian McShane, Timothy Alphon, all the regular actors, and finish this tale on the town to where you can close their stories, but also, like most TV shows, open to where it could bring in more new characters. So when the show does hopefully get revived in the end, Deadwood can have those high highs and be the talk of the town like The Wire was. And I'm going to stop. Time. All right, so Joe, we are moving on to your last 60 seconds. Uh, close out this argument. Time starts when you start talking. You said it yourself. Be the talk of the town like The Wire was. Do you know why? Because The Wire was the best. I said it before. The reason you want to do it is because you do a TV show is because you want to have fleshed out characters. Deadwood was good. It was small. It was contained, but it never grew. The Wire grew with every season. It introduced a new element to the story, but it never lost its focus on the characters and the story it was trying to tell. The reason Deadwood got made into a film office is because it never got the ending. It never fully told its story. The reason The Wire is the best is because it fully told its story. It did what it had to do, and it did it better. You look at any list, anywhere it's the best TV show of all time, or even just the best HBO TV original, show of all time it's always the wire versus the wire versus whether it's deadwood the sopranos game of thrones it's breaking bad it's always the wire versus because it was the best it told its story it did it brilliantly and that's all that needs to be said all right so now moving on to the judging and i'm going to go ahead and start off with this one um you know, I find a really interesting question to Ryan. You wanted in the closing. Um, here on question three, Ryan, I, I think you, you kind of lost it in the closing. Um, you spent the entire closing talking about how Deadwood should have ended. Um, and while it's a great YouTube channel and they make great content, uh, in late TV fights, it doesn't work out as well. Um, another thing that, that Joe really hammered you on is that Deadwood had some great moments, but it also had some really bad moments. Whereas The Wire um, had some really great moments, 
and just very rarely had some bad moments that they were nowhere near as bad as Deadwood. Plus getting that full complete story. Um, I am giving my vote to Joe on this one. So now we're moving on to the Raptor. Jonathan, who is getting your vote and why? Okay. Before I pick my piss, um, I love, even though I like both these shows, I want to pick either of them. We want to talk the true best show at HBO with this beauty around here. Right here. We didn't have we. Okay. Um, and the arguments themselves, I had to go with John this one right here. I'm a verse, couldn't get it to Ryan, but the ending, though, and even some of the arguments around here does a little bit of stumble around here, though. Even though there are some very great episodes of Deadwood, though, they're not so sort of the best ones either. And even your closing is starting to kind of follow up back around here with Joe's on the other hand, making more concise and good closing right here and a good compelling argument. So I had to give it to Joe. All right. And then with that, Joe gets the <coughs> point, avoiding the knockout. And Nikki, of course, because I love opinions. Who were you leaning towards on this one? It was hard because, like, I, I thought, Joe, you were really arguing harder. Um, but I felt like the points you were making almost supported Ryan more. But I, I would have given you the point because it just felt like you were arguing harder. That but it was just more of a concise argument. You knew what your points were and you knew what to say. So, yeah. All right. So we are moving on to question number four. Give me a second. My daughter's trying to talk to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> question number four. Talking about canceled TV shows. Question number four is, what canceled TV show should get the Firefly treatment and also the uh, Deadwood treatment, apparently? And, and so have a finale. The upcoming, even though it's a prequel, the May say it's a new one coming up this later this fall. Sorry for that plug. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> right. that <laughs> so what canceled TV show should get the Firefly treatment and have a finale made into a movie? Ryan, we are starting off with you for this question. 90 seconds on the clock. Time starts when you start talking. The show I picked that should be made into a movie is Community. This show, when it debuted on NBC, was not given the treatment it deserved, always being pushed around to different time slots, being thrown to different days. But the reason why it remained on NBC and why it was popular until its fifth season was because of the strong writing that came from Dan Harmon. How it always, every episode was meant to be a joke or it was supposed to sub or it was supposed to turn on head certain TV tropes. And the cast they had selected of Jeff, Annie, Troy, Abed, uh, Britta, Shirley, and Pierce was a great cut, was a great ensemble because each of them challenged certain walks of life. And the show throughout its entire one was fantastic. Season from its heights in season two and three, even though it dipped a little bit in season four, it still stayed true to what it was. So when it came back in season five, and then NBC unjustly cuts it to where it gets pushed to Yahoo. And even though many people want to disregard season six, season six still had the same on top, top notch writing that Dan Harmon was able to provide that you now see in Rick and Morty. And bringing it back would not only give a good conclusion with the Greendale 7, but it would bring back Donald Glover, who left in season five. We would get a nice reunion of Troy and Abed. We would finally get a conclusion to the will they, won't they between Annie and Jeff. And also, we have to, we have to fulfill the tagline. Six seasons in a movie, y'all. Six seasons in a movie. That's it. Time. Again, timing it perfectly. Joe, we are moving on to you. 90 seconds on the clock. Time starts when you start talking. The show I said needs to be brought back for a movie is Torchwood. Those of you who don't know, Torchwood was the first spin-off from Doctor Who, which debuted in 2006. It really was a show that was ahead of its time. It, like I said, it debuted in 2006. The cast was diverse. The lead was your... Your lead character was a bisexual, immortal badass. And the show itself just went from strength to strength. It was a monster of the week, detective type show. It, something like that had not been done before. It's a fantastic show, but it never really got the end it deserved. It had two full seasons. 
two seasons of it was an overarching story throughout but it never really got the end it's still carrying on in audio story form so the characters are still there the demand for the characters is still there but unlike community it never got its end community season six ha got its finale it was a send-off for the characters and the difference is we've talked with all the characters, the main actors, they're still there, they're, they're, they can still come back, they still do come back and do the audio stories. It's perfect to be made into a movie because it focuses on a more adult audience. It has it has the audience, it has the cast, it has the storylines, and who knows, could even get a cameo from a certain doctor that could appear. It has all the elements that are in for the perfect sci-fi movie. Conceding. Okay. Get a couple seconds left, but still want to ask because you should use every second wisely. So we have Joe with Torchwood, Ryan with Community. We have, again, I sound like a broken record at this point, five minutes on the clock. Gentlemen, let's fight it out. Five Joe. minutes on the clock. Time. Dang it, Ryan. You better hope they cut this out. This is my disappointed. <laughs> This is my disappointed dad look right now. This is my disappointing look. <sighs> okay. Five minutes on the clock. Time starts when someone starts talking. Joe, here's the thing about Torchwood. The, the element that you brought up about this show, the fact that it has a bisexual hero of Jack... He can if you in, if you try to tease the doctor showing up, they're gonna have to tone it down for the sake of children watching. Torchwood, in its essence, is an adult show. Even from its season three, of Children of Earth to Miracle Day, it dealt with adult mature topics. Now, bring it back as a movie that is not good. It works better as a miniseries format, and because you get to stretch out episodes focusing on character work. Community would work as a movie because you may have mentioned season six was his end, but the movie would bring the gang back together, all of them. It could either be- You're going to bring Chevy Chase back? You're going to bring Chevy Chase back? Yes, you can. It could be a flashback. It doesn't have to be their life after the community. This could just be an adventure of them during community, during what, either year four or year five to where- it's just another crazy adventure. They can re they can bring back the paintball. We will get characters like Dean Pelton back again, doing his on and off little sexual tension with Jeff. We would get Shirley back because she, despite what everyone wants to say about Shirley's character, she worked as a bit of a moral compass, but also slightly off being a religious judgmental zealot. Everyone in the group balanced out each other. And the reason why they balanced out each other was because they constantly brought out the best and the worst in each other. And even if it was just an 85 or 90 minute movie, I would love to see that again because Dan Harmon does great when he's able to write a story he wants to tell. Do you just want to set it at any point? The, diff the problem with Community is the actors, most of the actors were done with it. They fell off. Donald Glover left, Chevy Chase left. You're going to try and bring all these people back, trying to get them into the movie. The difference with Torchwood is it's set in the Doctor Who universe. You can set it literally anywhere, any when. Time travel is possible. You can have anything. You can give it any budget, give it any villain, give it any alien. You don't have to bring the Doctor in. You could bring a familiar villain from Doctor Who and you could do literally anything with this. The problem with community is that it already feels like the characters had that send off. I fell off season four and five, like a lot of people did, but I got back into it and I watched it again. And the finale really was the perfect send off for those characters. You just want to, and you said they've had their perfect send off, so let's just give them an old adventure. That, that's not fun. You know, we've seen, we've already seen where it ends, but the thing is, this is Dan Harmon here. He can even put on that trope stuff. in the movie. He plays, Dan Harmon loves to play on tropes. He always likes to do this objective route, like always turn something on his head like he does with the bottle episode. The episode where they're all trapped in the study room to look for <laughs> in is a great episode because it's just them in this little bottle moment. When it comes to playing on movie tropes, like with paintball, they use that with, they did that with military types, Star Wars, Westerns. Sure, it might be a little nostalgic there, but this is a good way to bring the cast back. And if you, if, if I do want to move them forward, we can do a reunion kind of episode. They can, we can create a movie to where they make fun of the high school slash community, the college reunions. Because guess what? I want to know exactly what Choi's done after his uh, year-long you know, journey with LeVar Burton. Here's the thing with Torchwood. 
Miracle Day set out the fact that we were going to get another Jack Hartness in Makai Pfeiffer's character. We're going to have two immortals running around. I don't want to see, I don't want them to try to set this in any part, part in time. It works better as a miniseries because we continue to follow Jack, Gwen Cooper. We lost Tosh. We have lost uh, Yanto. I mean, we can bring Martha Jones back in, but like I said, this can be better as a mini series because you can slowly structure each narrative to, to where you want to tell their story. As a movie, you're just going to limit it down. You're going to truncate everything just so you can get to the sparkly bits of Torchwood. All I'm hearing here that there would still be a demand for the Torchwood. There is still a demand for the Torchwood crew. You can see it on Twitter. You see it at the conventions. You can see it on the people that are still listening to the audio stories, myself included. But the difference is with community, those characters got their send off. The demand is not One there minute. anymore. I don't, I don't think there's a want there from the actors anymore. I think that Dan Harmon gave it that send off. They gave it that finale. The, half the cast had left by the end of season six. That's and that's that's where the issue comes from. Is that the demand is not there? If you're going to the cast to want to come back to do something like this together, and you're, then that's just that. This is kind of out there. I would, if the cast decide to come back for a movie, just a one off. I would still love that. Because let's be honest, they weren't given the right treatment on NBC, and the fact that, and just like with Firefly, they can't. They brought a movie back in with that with that universe. Sure, it didn't do great at the box office, but it was a good send off for the characters moving forward. Community would give us a stamp date. It would give us a true finalization because at the end of Community, we didn't know what was going on with Choi. There was little bits and pieces. Choi and Shirley were left out there in the ether. Let's have a movie to bring them back so we can get some true closure on those characters. Time. All right. We are now moving on to the one minute closing. Ryan, since we start off with you, Joe, you start off the closing. You have one minute on the clock. Time starts when you start talking. If you make torture into a movie for its send off, it doesn't even have to be for its send off because the point is these characters can keep going. This what the the universe that this show is set in. The possibilities are endless. You can set it in any time, in any place. You can set it in any budget. You can do anything with it. The problem with doing a movie for Community is that we already feel like we got a send off for these characters. Bringing them back, it feels forced. You would have issues with Chevy Chase, you know. Do you, and you, he even said it himself, bringing him back in a flashback that feels like a disservice to the character, a disservice that seems to be keep keeps being done to Community. Community had that finale; it was well written, it was a good send off, and it felt like the perfect send off for these characters. And bringing them back, it feels like it feels it's too forced, and it just feels like it wouldn't work in this day and age. But with Torchwood, there is still a demand for it. These stories are still being told, so. You, they've been told in TV form, they've been told in comic book form, and they've been told in audio story form. So why not move it to the next level and tell it in movie form? It's perfect, and then there's a perfect demand for it. Time. And that was perfect timing. It all just works out into the argument. All right, Ryan, close out this question. One minute on the clock, 60 seconds, and it starts when you start talking. The question was, which show we would like, which show we would like to be seen being brought back, turned into a movie, and that community fits that. You've already mentioned with Joe has mentioned with Torchwood that it's already done in audio, it's it's done in comics. Why would we want to bring that back into a movie when they can continue the narrative going forward? Community would work that way because while he keeps bringing back up that the characters that the series had already ended, the thing was we only had an end button for two characters. That's Jeff. And Annie, we don't, as I mentioned before, we don't know what happened with Troy and Shirley moving forward. Sure, they wrote them off in lines, but here's the thing in the movie, you bring them back. And here's the thing, Dan Harmon is on good terms with Chevy Chase again. Che he can bring back Chevy Chase if he feels like it. Now, here's the thing with the movie. You start off, let's say, years afterwards where Annie and Abed have had their adventures. They've done their uh, professional thing. Then we bring Troy back in because we need a reunion between Troy and Abed. We'll bring Shirley back in so we can get a lot from her and we can do a nod to Tibby Chase time serve this time a minute extension you should have said that uh, a minute ago yeah I know I should have <laughs> should have would have could have yeah soldier on all right so now we are moving on to the judging phase Jonathan 
Mr. Raptor Master, please start us off. Who gets your vote and why? Um, I was going to fact check on what uh, Ryan said that damn hard if it gets Chevy Chase still. And people may argue that we're worked with Chevy Chase. I don't think it's still a bit given, so that's my take on that. Um, um, interesting arguments between both of them right here. I think for me, well, very good arguments for either side. I had to go with uh, Joe on this one, though, so on his show. And Joe put the things that community doesn't need a movie to glorify the needs of it because the characters has already been given well about the spin off. I mean, the characters they let the show, the show's running, it felt like it was a good setup right here. And even he pointed out the reason that if you're trying to bring it back, though, it might be sort of a disservice to the characters. So I'm going to go with Joe. All right, so the first vote goes to Joe. Nikki, we are moving on to you next. Who gets your vote and why? Uh, This is why we debate, because if it was based off of the answers purely, I would have said Torchwood. I mean, that would have been my answer. But um, Ryan started arguing, and like one word that really just caught my attention was when he said paintball. And I just thought of like, uh, uh, and he said that you wouldn't have to have it be necessarily a sequel to the community, but more just any time taking place whenever. So, um, and and then you really had a good third round. So I'm going to give the point to Ryan there. Okay. So now we are moving on to me and I get to decide, is this match over? Are we going to a speed round? All this pressure is just right on me. You know, I could say, man, I really hate myself for doing this, but I signed up for it, so I can't really complain. Um, I am going to have to give my point to Joe. Uh, he was able <laughs> he was able to sell not only why it deserves a uh, spinoff movie, but also that there's demand for it. Uh, well, yes, there's the, um, the audio stories, people are still wanting um, a continuation, a finale, whereas with Community, they're not. Um, So he was really able to sell not only the reason um, why he thinks it should, but why most people think it should um, be be turned into a movie. So with that, we are moving on to the speed round. So the way the speed round works, I have a question. I am going to ask this question twice. After the second time I ask it, Joe, Ryan, you are going to answer by saying your name. So, Ryan, if you say uh, – once you say your name, I'm going to say your name. So, Ryan, if you say Ryan, I'm going to say Ryan. You're going to say what your answer is. Uh, By answering first, you get to go first with the speed round. Again, just like our normal, we have three rounds. First round is 45 seconds. Second round is 30 seconds, and the last round is 20 seconds. Um, your rounds, your time, you can do whatever you want. It is your time. Use it however you want it. The only thing is that first 45 seconds, please do not attack your opponent. Um, we ask that you you save the attacking for the second and third round. Uh, just your first round, build up your answer uh, and the reasons why. Other than that, though, I don't care. Do what you want. You're all grown men. So, I'm going to ask the question. And again, I will ask it twice. After the second time, say your name. If you say your name after the first time, you will get the disappointed dad look. And I will repeat the question again. So, here is your question. Who is the best character in the Big Bang Theory? Again, who is the best character in the Big Bang Theory? Go Joe, go ahead. Penny. So we have Joe with Penny. Ryan. I'm with Sheldon Cooper. Sheldon Cooper. All right. So, Joe, you have... 45 seconds to open up this speed round. Time starts when you start talking. 
the reason Penny is the best character on the Big Bang, Bang Theory is because she feels like she's the most fleshed out of all the characters. She actually feels like she's the only character that's actually based on a real person. A lot of the other characters in this show just feel like they're the sort of person that a jock would write. Ha, <laughs> laugh at the nerd. Look at the nerd. That's what a nerd is. And that's exactly what all the other characters feel like. The difference is Penny is fleshed out. She's got character stories. She has development. And you just see her character go throughout the show. And that's the reason she is the best character. Are you conceding? Her relationship with... Oh, no. Her relationship throughout the show is just shown just to, it's just shown that how she can accept and change, which compared to her character uh, character in the very first episode, this show... Time! Leonard! All right, <laughs> All right Ryan. 45 <laughs> seconds to start your argument. Time starts when you start talking. Sheldon Cooper is the best character throughout the show because when we're introduced to him, of course, through everyone, he's, he's very cold. He's kind of, he's purely based on logic. And sure, he is definitely the nerd care trope that we would point and laugh at. But the thing is, going throughout the season, you see that he is, out of every character throughout the show, Sheldon is very confident in himself because he's used his intelligence and his skills to get him to the field he's designed for. Throughout the entire show, we mainly see how Sheldon has to try to adjust, has to adapt, or even try to bend his values in order to appease his friends. Sure, it ends up in his favor all the time, but the thing is, we have to see Sheldon himself grow throughout the entire thing. The fact that we, he gets a girlfriend introduced shows that Sheldon has to not only mature as a person, but how can he mature as a man or as just as time. a woman. empathetic guy. Yeah. Yep. We uh, cannot take your empathetic yeah. guy, Ryan. I am sorry. <laughs> All right, Joe. 30 seconds to continue this argument. And just like every other round, time starts when you start talking. You want to show me a good character that's based on logic and has to grow emotionally throughout the season? I'll take Mr. Spock from Star Trek any day of the week. The problem with Sheldon is he's conceited, he's narcissistic, and even in terms of his relationship, he, he can be seen to basically be a, um, psychologically abusive. The difference with Penny is that she always tries to be accepting of Leonard. She tries, she's always been welcoming to the group, and every and almost every time she's just shown to be one of the nicest, friendliest characters on the show, whereas everybody else is a gross stereotype of what the of what the cool guys think a nerd is. The show itself... Time! Ryan, 30 seconds to keep this argument going. Time starts and you start talking. Penny could have been introduced. Penny was introduced as someone who was empathetic, warm, and understanding. But it's not until we move further down into the seasons we realize that she is manipulative. She, just like Sheldon, is very selfish of herself. See with her relationship with Leonard, how Leonard has to bend over backwards to please her. It's not until later in the season she finally has to realize she needs to please her her, her own partner. With Sheldon, we see with Sheldon, he has to grow. I mean, he has to make compromises at times. He's not a depiction of a cool guy of a nerd. He is suffering. He is brutish and cold and calculated. But it's not until time. Else... Okay. All right, Joe. Twenty seconds to close this argument out. Time starts when you start talking. See, I think you're totally wrong about Penny. I think the thing with Penny is that it shows you said that she's selfish and manipulative, but actually, it's more like Leonard feels like he has to bend over backwards to please her. But actually, it's, it's totally not the case. Penny is warm, she's loving, she's always been kind, and she's shown to be one of the best, has the best character growth in the show. Whereas Sheldon has always been the butt of the joke. He's always trying to, you know, because he's cold and calculating, and he's, he's just there to get the look. Like Time. The Ryan, 20 seconds to finish this out. Time starts when you start talking. Sheldon is the best character of the show because, yeah, he may be the butt of the joke, but guess what? He may not be in the joke all the time, but guess what? We get a lot of catchphrases from him. From, we get Bazinga. We get the Rock, Paper, Scissors, Leonard, Leonard uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors, Leonard, Spock. Penny, when we when she becomes friends with Amy and Burnett, she is just as manipulative as Sheldon is with Leonard, Howard, and Raj. But Sheldon, he actually has to grow through the series. Time. Now, time. Time. Got it. All right. <laughs> Ryan, we obviously see how much you love uh, speed rounds. <laughs> so, Nikki, we are starting off with you. Please well, tell us who gets your yeah. vote. 
Uh, both of you are wrong. The correct answer is none of those characters. Um, Big Bang Theory is everything I hate about mainstream culture. Um, Joe, you said all the right things. I got to give the point to you. I'm sorry. Just got. I have to do it. You said all the right things. You were speaking to me, and I, I just congratulations. Just, just double check. I heard you. You said you're going to give it to Joe. Yeah, he did. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. My, right. my family's here, so occasionally I'll say something, and then they're uh, ah, la, la. It, it drowns out. But I love y'all. Y'all are the best. <laughs> He just turns around and watches his TV shows again. That's how much they love me. All right. So with one vote, Joe, Jonathan, who are giving your point to and why? All right. Take out my feelings out of the way. During an argument's sake, I had to give it to Joe because mm. <laughs> you put up a reasonable why. Like, out of the characters right here – Probably most of the characters are kind of stereotyped at the beginning, of, but he kind of convinced me what Penny is not being that bad of a stereotype either. So I had to get to Joe on that one. <coughs> All right. And so, and with that- your winner, Joe Hot Fuzz Fairly. Just because I love opinions, I was leaning the same way too. Um, Joe again just said, said a couple more things in your favor. Um, you know, we get the full fleshed out arc with Penny, um, whereas you know we see we see Sheldon adapt, but we never see the actual arc. Um, and Ryan, your uh, one thing, your biggest knock against um, Penny, uh, you, literally the words you said. Um, you know, she's manipulative just like Sheldon is. And I'm like, really, your one attack, you uh, you hit yourself, you, you shot yourself in the foot with the, with that little statement, too. Um, again, this was uh, another fantastic match. Um, there's a reason this is the road to the finals, uh, because y'all two are some of the best in this league. But Joe, you won this match. How are you feeling after this? Um, exhausted. I'll be honest. At two and oh, two, 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 two nil down, I just had to dig deep and, and fight. And Mommy. I'm just glad the speed round question was about the show I'd seen. Because just for the record, I've never seen Deadwood. I've never seen Castle. I've never. Oh. Seen, I've never. Oh, it's always funny. I've never seen The Wire. So we're I've in the same episodes of The Wire. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and if we're all confessing. Um, <laughs> No, that's not what we're here for. So, Joe, do you want to know who you're going to play next? Oh, why not? Okay, I was going to say it doesn't. It doesn't matter what you it want. Doesn't matter who I'm playing. <laughs> that's my little rock impersonation, uh, Chris Day. You can learn from that and get good at stuff. Oh, yeah. Unlike right now, yep. where you suck at everything. Uh, I'm sorry. That was just a personal attack at someone who was really annoying. Whatever. Um. So, you are going to take on the winner of Jacoby Bancroft and Richard Schwartz. Is there any one of those two that you are looking forward to to fight more than the other? I'll say this like I'm going to talk about the movie, next season of the movie trivia face-off. It doesn't matter who I play. The result's going to be the same. All right. Confidence. That's what I like to see. Now we are moving on to Ryan. Ryan, you weren't able to close us out, but you did a fantastic job. How are you feeling? Ooh. You know, brother, I can't I tell you right now, I am not in the best state of mind because it seems to me that everyone out there doubts my ability to play. Because I lose to Jay Burns all of a sudden. People want to see that you don't have it anymore. Well, let me tell you something. I still got it. 
Sure, I didn't win the match, but look, I'm going to tell you this. I even like to drop off with a big elbow drop, brother. This is exactly how every match moving forward in the late TV fights are going to be. I'm sorry I confused it with the movie trivia face-off, but let's one thing between Joe. If I see you in the movie trivia face-off, brother, both you and me are going to be going one-on-one -on -one with these maybe 10, 8-inch hot dogs. But who is That's one thing for sure. But here's the thing. Ooh. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I'm losing my voice. I'm losing my voice. <laughs> Look, I'm not happy most of the course. Maybe I should have stayed driving because I was on point. That's how I got my two and oh ahead lead. Maybe I found the key there. Maybe if I just sit in my car and not worry about what I'm looking at. Maybe that maybe I can argue much better. I think I may have found something there. But Joe, you did a fantastic job, man. Look, um, this is nothing against my performance. You came back swinging strong, and I appreciate it. I mean, do I want to aim for a knockout? Of course I do. But at the same time, I really want to get the question four because I love that question. And what you got me there. On and I like Torchwood. I just felt like when it came to look, okay. Question, personal feelings aside, Joe, you did a fantastic job. I can't wait to watch your next match. But here, walking down that road, and I'm going to be jet flying, wheeling, dealing, brother, before I come up to you. Woo! Oh, yeah, brother. Yeah, my mother man uh, holding uh, the match there. <laughs> <laughs> and Ryan, is there anyone uh, in the late TV fight you are looking forward to taking on and taking down? Honestly, no. I kind of like to leave it. At, I, I kind of like to leave this whole thing like in those noir films. I'm just a detective sitting at my desk waiting for the next case to be brought to me. And my opponent could be walking through that door or it could be you or Alec walking through that door giving me my next assignment. I'm not gonna go out there looking for my opponent trying to rattle some feathers. If I want a rubber mat, if let's for, let's say for example, Joe doesn't win against either Jacoby or who else his opponent was, I would love a rematch against Joe or the other Joe, honestly. I would love rematches. That's one thing's for sure. Because this is just fun. Or heck, if Kevin is out there, I know he's looking for some redemption as well. I would love to fight, I would love to play him. But in the meantime. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to be going. I'm going. I'm just going to take a break for right now. And, you know, get, be ready. I mean, hell, you might see me in nerd fights or game zone, but I'm not done in late TV fights. That's for sure. All right. Well, that, that's what I like to hear, that you're always ready. And you know who else is ready? Bonesaw is ready. Three minutes playtime. <laughs> And there goes our amazing impersonations. Uh, this is why we are not stand-up comedians we could or try. Uh, impersonators like uh, some people are. I completely forgot about uh, people's names. Um, but anyways, that's not what we're talking about. We, have, we had a great match today. We are going to have great matches here in the future. Joe is going on in the road to the title to take on either Jacoby or Richard. And with that, I have been your 15th favorite dad in the family communities, Jacob West, Papa West. That has been Jonathan Peck, the, Ra the Raptor Master. That has been Joe Fairley, Mr. Hot Fuzz. And Ryan, Carmel Mountain, Major Pain. I'll have a this name. Has been, I'll have a name. <laughs> this has been late TV fights, and we will see you on the next episode. What?